Hey, hello and welcome back to Egg Topics, a podcast for nurses. I'm Nurse Rob. Hey, it's Nurse Amy. Welcome back to part two or episode six. We kind of opened a can of worms on our last episode and so we're kind of doing a follow-up episode um, to continue on a little bit of a roll that we got on to. Um, so much to talk about. I know. So we're going to continue on with fevers. We're going to continue on with um, why not give antipyretics. Um, we're going to continue on with troponin a little bit. So if you haven't listened to our previous episode or episode five, definitely go back and give that one a listen to before this one and it will kind of make it a nice little wrap present for you because it will make a bit more sense. And because this episode, which is episode six of our podcast, um, is so closely related to and almost like the sequel, I suppose, to to episode five, uh, that's why we're dropping two episodes in this week. So yeah. normally we only do a weekly podcast, but dang it, we're giving you the love. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so... Yeah, I reckon. Hey, speaking of the love. Yeah. Did you hear those beautiful things Nurse Tay said about us? Yeah, it made me cry. It made you, well, everything makes you cry at the moment. Yeah. Um, yeah, the the TikTok that T- Nurse Tay on TikTok posted. Sorry, that made no sense. The TikTok that Nurse Tay posted um, basically saying how much she was enjoying our Ect Topics podcast was so beautiful and lovely. I was really nervous about talking about my mental health, obviously, it's not something that's comfortable all the time to talk about, especially to people I don't know very well. But she kind of made me realise that it's actually could be potentially really helpful for some people. And I think that that's really lovely. Um, and we're just so glad that people that are, you know, our colleagues are really, really enjoying our podcast. I think that's really cool. It is really cool yeah. because we started with pretty much no real goal. We yeah. Just- I just wanted to yap. It's actually quite interesting how our podcasts uh, started. Um, it was about it was about friends and colleagues who just said, "I just love hearing you guys chat." Yeah, <laughs> which is so funny. I could just I could just sit on the couch and listen to you two have a conversation. Yeah, and um, you should record it and see if others enjoy doing it. And as it turns out, like you guys are loving it. So hey, yeah. thank you, thank, thank you. you. We we love the comments and we love the feedback yeah. and. Um, I think we hit a huge 100 followers. Stop it. I know. That's whack. I, know. I can whack only actually that? count to 100, so that's really exciting. I know. What? Okay. Now, listen, we started talking about um, exciting topics like um, troponin and, and fever we and did. paracetamol. Um, I don't feel that there's a whole lot of conversation that we need to have ultimately around um, paracetamol and fever. Yeah, but we've kind of covered that. There's a couple of themes that I, I guess we just wanted to, to pick up on in case the message isn't clear. Um, and I'm going to talk about evidence. Yeah. Oh, wow. Well, that's what I do. You're awesome. Go for gold. I don't know anything, so go. Okay. And this is the thing. Uh, you're going to find that the debate of whether – antipyretics should be given to people with trivial fevers. And let's just define, make sure our definitions are clean, okay? A low-grade fever is a temperature up to 39.5. And I know that seems like a big temperature, but that is benign. That's harmless. So that's a low-grade temperature. Over 39.5, we might call that a hyperpyrexia. Not to be confused with hypothermia, but a hyperpyrexia. Now, when hyperpyrexia happens, occasionally we can see that somebody will desaturate. And that's fundamentally because your haemoglobin doesn't like to carry oxygen when it gets too hot. Happens when you get too acidic as well. So acidosis and very high temperatures tend to cause you to desaturate. So at the point that somebody's temperature rises above 39.5, Please keep a close eye on their sats. That's what we're saying. And if it looks like they're starting to desaturate, of course, they're going to have a whole lot more problems than just a fever. And it's quite reasonable to bring down the temperature because of the number on the thermometer and the sats. Slay. Help them to oxygenate. Slay. The second thing that I wanted to talk about is this uh, inane assertion that high temperatures cause fits in children, febrile convulsions. Not a sleigh. The height of the temperature does not contribute to the risk of fitting. 
the speed at which a temperature rises, that's the thing that causes fitting. So it's the rapid increase. Your body basically freaks the heck out and goes, what is going on? I'm now going to put my temperature right up. And then your brain's like, what the flip floppity fuck? And just you go into a fit. So just don't, just be cool, okay? Look, the point is this. Your hypothalamus (laughs) is like every other organ in your body is maturing as you're a child. And up until around about the age of three, although some references suggest up to around about the age of six, that thermoregulation that occurs within the brain's hypothalamus is immature. And this can cause a rapid spiralling of temperature and therefore can induce a fit in some people who are susceptible to it. Yeah? Yeah. Now, a febrile convulsion can be considered to be complex or simple. Simple febrile convulsions... Simple febrile convulsions are febrile convulsions that are completely benign, completely harmless. Unless they fitted and fell out of bed and hurt themselves, they're a harmless thing. They look violent. They're incredibly frightening to care yeah, for. Yeah, absolutely. They're Scary. frightening as a parent. Yeah, of course. Okay. And, and, and I understand all the emotion that's attached to a child having a febrile convulsion. But the rule of thumb is this. If a child has a simple febrile convulsion, which is benign, as violent as it might look, it's going to meet three criteria. First criteria is this. That fit will only happen in the first 24 hours. 24 hours from the time they first spike their temperature. So a kid gets a throat infection, spikes a temperature, they will only fit in that first 24 hours. Same with an earache, same with an appendicitis, same with any kind of fever-inducing illness. If they're going to have a febrile convulsion, it only happens in that first 24 hours. They haven't been sick for days, and then they had a fit. And if they did, that wasn't a febrile convulsion. That was something more neurologically sinister. Okay? Bad vibes. So that's the first one. Yeah. They only have one fit for this episode of illness. So however long they've got their croup, they might have their croup for a week, but they'll only have one febrile convulsion, if at all. Can I ask a question? You can. If someone, if a child has a febrile convulsion, are they more susceptible to get more febrile convulsions? Yes, they are. Why is that? I can't answer that question, Amy. It's a really good question. Um, The body goes, oh, that was a bit of fun. Let's do it again. Yeah. 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 That's actually what happens. That's scientifically proven. Yeah. I'm kidding. Don't. I'm kidding. Okay. Continue. So, um... The other sort of question that comes along that's kind of related to that, and that is if that child's siblings Mm. have had febrile convulsions, does that make them more susceptible? So if your brother had febrile convulsions when he was, you know, six months old to three years old, does that make you susceptible to having febrile convulsions in that same age group? And it does. There is an increase increase in incidence there. That's interesting. Okay. So remember the other first two criteria. Yeah. It only happens once. It only happens in the first 24 hours. And the third criteria, and this is about the length of the fit itself, and the clever textbooks tell us that the fit can go up to 15 minutes. Wow. I I don't know what kind of psychopathic nurse or doctor is going to watch a fit go for 15 minutes and go, yep, okay, that's 15 minutes now. We'll do something about it. Yeah, yeah. Do you know what I mean? (laughs) Yeah. Um, I, I can I can tell you the truth, and that is if you brought your child into an emergency department and they were fitting, then we're going to do everything we can to try and make that child safe, roll them onto their side, yeah. put the side rails up, and, and ultimately give them something to stop the seizure. Yeah, absolutely. And the drug of choice, usually in Australia, we use midazolam. Midazolam. Yeah. Midazolam. Um, Jinx. Yeah. Buy me a Coke. Uh, we'll stick that midazolam up their nose. So we'll spray it up their nose with a little atomization device called a, a MAD. Have you heard of a MAD? I know what, like we, I learned about it in disability work, but is it called a MAD? MAD, mucosal what? atomization device. Oh, yuck. It's called a MAD. Um, while we're on, because I know we're going to finish talking about um, fevers and, and rigors really quick. So I just have one question that I found on your TikTok. I feel like you're winding me up, like you've heard enough about. No, I'm not winding you up. Okay, good. No, I just didn't want us to move on and then for me to not be answering this question. Okay, let's ask some questions. It's just one question that I found. Okay. Um, What about when we're taking septic, when we're talking septic temp jumping up to 42 degrees? Also, 
Can you talk on the difference between septic shower and sepsis? We get a lot of urology stents that have septic showers. Okay, so sepsis and infection are two totally different concepts. Correct. All right. So we, what we need to do is we need to have a whole conversation around sepsis to best address that question. Let's make so, that another episode. Absolutely. So septic shower or septic storm is another one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a septic storm. It's also sometimes referred to as a cytokine storm. Mm -hmm. So it's cytokine storm is a term that we heard a lot about during, uh, during COVID. Yeah. Right, when everyone was having a cytokine storm. It was pretty bad. So it's essentially a, a cocktail of immune chemicals. So when your immune system is is hypersensitized or hyperactivated as a result of a, um, a you know a pretty freaky kind of an infection, mm -hmm. then um, all of the inflammatory chemi chemicals that are produced by the liver and your immune cells and complements and C-reactive proteins and all these different immunoglobulins that are floating around, these cytokines, essentially cell communication chemicals, um, trigger a, a, a response where the immune system can potentially lose its way and become what's called dysregulated. So if you've got a an infection, and, and I think the person who asked the question was talking about bladder infections, right? Mm -hmm. So the immune system should be attacking the infection in the bladder. Yeah. But if it loses its way, then the immune system now starts to produce vasoactive substances that cause kidney injury and lung injury and cerebral injury and heart injury and alter blood pressure. And this is when we start to see the symptoms become systemic. Okay. Now, if you've got a bladder infection, you're expecting to, you know, feel like you're peeing razor blades, to have frequency and abdominal pain and probably smelly urine and, you know, all of those sort of symptoms of UTI yeah, are yeah. essentially known and, and predictable. Yeah. And we as nurses or paramedics are going to recognise that that collection of symptoms correlates very well with a bladder infection, right, mm -hmm. a cystitis. Mm -hmm. But those symptoms, that, that person with a bladder infection shouldn't lose their level of consciousness. Mm -hmm. They shouldn't drop their blood pressure and go into kidney failure. Yeah. They, shouldn't, they shouldn't have rapid respiratory rates and they shouldn't come out in, in, in bleeds under their skin, particular rashes. Yeah. They are systemic symptoms. Yeah. And so if your patient with a localised infection now starts to develop a systemic symptom, then we have to suspect sepsis. And as a result, that sepsis comes from that septic shower or that septic storm. That's yeah. so interesting. It's crazy. I heard Dickhead on TikTok, this awful human being, I don't even know what his name is, um, try to preach that you shouldn't be giving antibiotics for infections in women because it can cause anxiety and depression. Okay, so... so as much as I try to do a lot of teaching on TikTok, yeah. social media is probably not the place to go for your sole source of medical information. Yeah, no, I know. It just came and up and I was like, the wow. The sad reality it. is that there is, a, um, there is a, a lowest common denominator out there um, for uh, obtaining information and it's very, very easy to go and doom scroll on social media and come up with all sorts of theories. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Just look at what's happening in the world with certain countries voting in certain people. That we will not be discussing We're not going further, to mention that because any further because Amy will go want. on a rant and probably cry. Anyways, and, and we also need to have respect for the fact that a country should have its um, have the right and the determination to choose its leader, and that's exactly what's happened. So, you know, for all those same reasons. We we don't we're not to have an opinion. I have an opinion. I know you have an opinion. Anyways, Anyways. so let's do troponin. Okay. I actually can't remember what we covered in our. Um, okay, so, so do you want to talk about troponin? Yeah. Well, yeah. Okay. Do you? Let's talk about troponin. Okay. Go for gold. I can't remember what we. <laughs> well, I think I think we sort of started on on troponin, and it might not be a bad idea when you listen back to this before you edit the podcast mm. that we don't cover cover old ground. Mm. But troponin is a protein that is inside the muscle cell of a heart. Yes. Now, there is troponin in other muscle cells as well, but I want you to think of 
troponin as three different proteins packaged together. And we're going to call those troponins, troponin C, troponin I, and troponin T. Are you okay. kidding? I'm not kidding. Why does it have to be so complex? It doesn't. It's, it's, you've only got to count to three. You've got enough fingers. You can do this. I know, but... You've got this. Oh, heck. Okay, okay. so there's three types of troponin. That's not just normal troponin. Well, <laughs> so, so here's the thing. There's troponin C, and that's found in all muscles. So let's forget troponin C for a moment okay. and just think about two troponins. We're going to we'll cancel call them, troponin C. We're going to call them troponin I and troponin T. Why not ABC? Why can't we just have some simplicity in medicine? Okay, so troponin T is called troponin T because it's bound to a filament within the muscle called tropomyosin. Of course it is. So that's where it gets the name troponin T from. But let's not go down that wormhole of deep chemistry. Okay? Let's not. Let's just, I, I want you to understand that troponin is a protein inside a heart muscle cell. Okay. okay. Troponin I and T yeah. are inside a heart, heart muscle, muscle cell, cell, which means if I broke a heart muscle cell, bad vibes. Then the troponin T and the troponin I can leak out. Yeah. yeah. Troponin leak. Now, in my in in our last episode, do you remember I said if you can imagine a heart cell like an egg, mm-hmm. if I was to drop the egg on a table and smash the egg, then the yolk and the and the the white can ooze over the bench. Yes. Well. Imagine that that egg is a heart cell. If I broke the heart cell, then the yolk, troponin T, and the white, troponin I, can leak out over the bench, mm-hmm. can leak into the bloodstream, mm-hmm. okay? And and it starts then to rise in the blood, and I can pick it up using troponin tests. Pause, can I ask a question? Of course. So is obviously the troponin leak is a indicator of cardiac damage or yes. cardiac yep. a- attack. Spot on. Is troponin in the bloodstream dangerous? No. Like it's not harmful? It's No. It's, it's just not. an indicator. It's an indicator. Cool. Yeah. A little bit like, um, yeah, it, no, no, it's not It's not dangerous. Yeah. It just indicates that there's been some heart damage. Yeah. Okay. It's not like lactate where that can send you acidotic. It's well, that, that's like, true. That said, lactate can also be helpful. Um, we've always got a little bit of lactate now. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. that's another podcast. That eh? is a whole pot. That's like four episodes. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, I love lactate. Anyway, so let's let's assume that you've got, um, and I'm going to circle back and come back to the to that troponin that's now floating around the bloodstream. But let, let's just talk very very briefly about. I have had an injury to my heart muscle. Predictably, therefore, I'm leaking troponin. Mm-hmm. And that troponin can continue to leak for anything up to 24 hours. It peaks at about nine hours. But if I've had a massive myocardial event, like a big MI, yeah, or a big cardiac injury, let's say somebody, you know, my, my, my chest hit the steering wheel in a car crash and I had a crush injury to my heart, or I've had, you know, been shot or stabbed in my heart, yeah, I've had some sort of a, a major cataclysmic myocardial injury event. Cataclysmic? Yes. It's a big wow, word. Wow, that's a good word. It's a good word. I'm going to try and fit that into work today. Cataclysmic? Just somewhere. There we go. Then it's reasonable that you're going to have a large amount of muscle injury. Mm. And a large amount of muscle injury is a large amount of troponin leak. Think about the different what your bench would look like if you dropped one egg on it versus dropping a dozen eggs on it, okay? Yeah, yeah. The more injury, the more the leak, Yeah. the faster the leak. Yeah. So a massive myocardial infarction, you might see a troponin leak within minutes. Mm. A very, very small myocardial infarction, it might not peak until about that 9 to 12-hour mark. So that's why we do the two troponin tests. That's why we do troponin tests. Oh, if if so the first sense. one wasn't really convincing yeah. of a car- cardiac injury, the second one demonstrates some elevation, then we might say, hmm, there's a good story here yeah. to support the diagnosis of a myocardial injury, an MI. So if the first one... Which just, can I just go back? Yeah. Myocardial injury, and then I said an MI, that's not what MI stands for. No, it's myocardial infarction. So MI is myocardial infarction, death yeah. of the myocardium, but Bad an injury vibes. is the first step. Yeah, slay. Okay, so we're at troponin, yeah. okay? Now, 
of course, there would be some other symptoms. So when, when we as paramedics or nurses are assessing a patient with chest pain who's having a cardiac event, then we're looking at what kind of chest pain they have and do they have any other symptoms. So it would be quite reasonable to look at things like is there any shortness of breath, ankle swelling, skin indicators of shock like pale, cold, clammy, clammy tachycardia, yeah, bradycardia. And, and, and looking at blood pressure can sometimes be, you know, be a little bit, little bit poorly if somebody's having a myocardial event. If I've, if I've got a, you know, heart damage, then I, I may have a reduction in cardiac output. Um, so we've got all of those symptoms. Nausea and vomiting is a very big one. So we've got all these other symptoms in accordance with chest pain. Now, classically, typically, and this is called typical chest pain, typically cardiac chest pain from a myocardial infarction is going to be represented as central retrosternal sitting behind your, your your breastbone so sitting behind your sternum and does radiate typically and it can radiate into the jaw the teeth your shoulders down both arms although left-sided radiation pain seems to be more common some forms of heart attack particularly in women radiate straight between the back almost between the shoulder blades, like a stabbing, searing pain running between the shoulder blades. And that's very classic of a, of a, um, a, a type of myocardial infarction called a SCAD, which is a, a dissection. It's a sudden coronary artery dissection, S-C-A-D, a sudden coronary artery dissection, where a little aneurysm forms and dissects the, um, the, one of the coronary arteries. Anyhow point is this heart muscle dies yeah not good broken eggs bad vibes leaking t and i troponin and i and t yeah and as that troponin i and t gets into the bloodstream we measure that as a troponin rise now at big hospitals like where you work they probably are looking at troponin high sensitivity troponins and high sensitivity troponin your cutoff might be about 14 or 17, somewhere around 14 to 17, high teens, is considered normal, which would suggest that your body, my body, her body, his body, their body, will all have some troponin floating around in it. And you would say, well, if troponin's only found inside heart muscle, why is it that somebody that doesn't have heart muscle damage have troponin mm. in their blood? Why do they have any in mm. their blood? Well, heart cells are always dying. Yeah. And so because they're always dying, of course, they're going to leak their very, very, very tiny concentrations of troponin into the blood. Mm -hmm. So the fate of troponin, what happens to it once it gets into the blood? So we can measure it in the blood saying, oh, we're suspecting a cardiac injury. But the liver gets rid of that troponin. The liver metabolizes it. And troponin is quite a large protein molecule, too big to be excreted through kidneys. Remember, kidneys don't excrete proteins, right? So protein doesn't go through and if kidneys. if they do, then your kidney's not working your very well. Your kidney's buggered, right? Your kidney's are buggered. So if, you're, um, if you are metabolising your troponin normally, then you would expect it to take somewhere between 7 and 14 days for that troponin level to be disappear out of your blood. Wow. So you could have a heart attack a week ago, two yeah. weeks ago, and I can still see a troponin elevation or a troponin rise in your blood. What is the spleen? Pardon? Like, what even is the spleen? The spleen? What does it actually do and where is it? Like, I actually, like, I know it exists, you, you but I really don't. You seriously struggle with ADD, don't you? I just don't know <laughs> what a spleen is and it really upsets me. Well, you don't have too is much to do with a spleen. Is that a dumb question? Well, it's not a dumb question because I think a lot of people would go, I'm aware of a spleen but don't really know what it does. It, I really don't. It's one of our immune organs. Oh. So your spleen, the simplest way to describe your spleen is it does exactly the same as what your tonsils do. So not much. Well, hang on a second. Tonsils are pretty important. I don't have tonsils. Which is probably why you get a whole lot of throat infections. I don't ever throats. get throat infections. But you get chest infections and sore throats. Yeah, I do. Anyway, the point is this. The spleen is an organ that is found up under your stomach on the, the right upper quadrant, left, sorry, left, don't come at me, left <laughs> upper quadrant. <laughs> I'm 
got my lefts and rights wrong. Don't attack. It's in your left upper quadrant, up in there underneath your stomach. And, and, and what it does is it recycles your blood. You know, your red blood cells die every 120 days. So they're born in the bone marrow. Yeah. They circulate for about four months. Yeah. And then they're killed off. Oh, that's yeah. really sad. The slaughterhouse, that's the spleen. Are you serious? That's right. That's all it does. Well, no, it's not all it does. It does other things like it harbours, because it's part of your lymphatic system, it, it harbours lymphocytes. Oh, so as blood circulates those. through the spleen, this is a really nice sort of a sampling system for your blood to be able to say, is there anything in the blood that I need to be concerned about and produce antibodies for? Remember, lymphocytes are those white blood cells, yeah. T cells and B cells. Yeah. Those B cells make antibodies, right? So if you've got a little infection or a parasite or something floating around inside your bloodstream, and now that infection starts to circulate through the spleen, the spleen's going to upregulate the formation of antibodies to help you to fight that germ in your blood. Can you see your blood is the most toxic place in the world for a pathogen to live? So if it was enlarged, your spleen... Then you're fighting something, aren't you? It's not fun. It's not fun, but it makes sense, right? Yeah. So the other job that the spleen does is that it recycles the components of a red blood cell. So do you remember what red blood cells are made out of? Everyone's listening to the podcast waiting for the answer. You're I not actually alive. don't know. Have you heard of iron deficiency anemia? Yeah. Okay, so what are red blood cells made out of then? Iron. Radio. So there's a large amount of iron within, iron. The, within the protein called heme. 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 Just heme. H-E-M-E. Heme. 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 It's like meme, right? It is. It is. There we go. A heme meme. Finally, the X generation's talk, starting to talk Y generation, so she understands. Wow. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so um, heme. Heme. It's it, metabolically expensive to manufacture the heme, that protein inside the red blood cells that carries oxygen because the heme gets joined with a protein called globin. Now you've got... Hemoglobin. Hemoglobin. Why is it called he? Why isn't it hemoglobin? If it's he, why does the A come from? Don't make me come at you. No, seriously, where does the A I, come from? I don't know. Hemoglobin. Well, you claim to know it, but you don't. Just kidding. Ouch. I know that was really mean. I'm sorry. It was really mean. You really know everything. I do not. I, I so do not. I really All right, stupid. so here's the point. My okay. point is this. Let's get the point. The spleen's going to take that red blood cell and it's going to rip it to pieces, the dead ones, right? So when the red blood cell goes to the spleen, that it's like, you know, the big rest centre in the sky. Are you serious? So the red blood cell, does it know that it's about to die? I don't think it's sen a sen sen sentient. I don't think it, it has consciousness. So it goes to the spleen and then it gets ripped apart. It gets, gets dismantled. Really fucked up. And then what happens is, and then what happens is the heme, it gets recycled. It goes to bone marrow and it becomes brand new babies. Bees. It becomes new, new red blood cells. And, and part of that red blood cell, well, that becomes a, a, a substance called biliverdin, which becomes bilirubin. And that goes to the liver and the bilirubin processes it and joins it with cholesterol and turns it into bile. Of course it does. Yeah, you I... need to grab a pen and paper and write so, that stuff down. Aren't we... you glad that there's not a quiz at the end of this? Sorry, that's really fucked up. No, it's not. It's a bit, it's a bit sad though. It's not sad. Why it's... does you only get to live for four months? Okay, so red blood cells are born with a protein on the outside of them that makes them capable of not just carrying oxygen but delivering oxygen. So I want you to think of a brand new red car. When it's born, it's bright and shiny. When it's a few years old, it's become dull, hasn't it? It's not as shiny and as and as flash as what it was when you first bought it. Its paint job sort of fades. Yeah? Mm. Okay. So in a situation where red blood cells are born, they've got this protein on the outside of them called 2,3, diphosphoglycerate or DPG. Are you joking? Say it after me. Two, three, a DPG. I'm not so doing that. You, go, you want to do it. I don't. You do. That's, I'm not going to ever say remember that. Two, three, a How does a DPG. that just stay in your brain? Like, where anyway, anyway stay with me because this bit, this is actually quite interesting. So two, three, a DPG. It's like, think of it as the red spray paint on the outside. It, it's incorrect to think of it like this, but it's just a nice, easy way to remember it, right? You say, how do I remember stuff? I think of stories and pictures, okay? So 
I want you to picture a bright red, red blood cell, freshly born with a nice fresh spray paint coat of 2,3 DPG. Amazing. Got it? Yeah. Now, because it's got a fresh coat of DPG, it's capable of not just carrying oxygen, but it can deliver the oxygen when it gets to the cells that want the oxygen. Mm-hmm. All right. So it's not just a deli- – it's a delivery truck is essentially what a red blood cell is. Got it? Mm-hmm. Good. Now, as that paint fades, the DPG protein – it's a little amino acid on the outside that fades – that red blood cell towards the end of its life can carry – oxygen very well Mm -hmm. like it always did but can't give away the oxygen it can't give away the oxygen so cells start to become hypoxic in the presence of blood that's got a lot of old red blood cells in it so we have to recycle and that's why we have a spleen so we're constantly turning over red blood cells wow did you know that you make 250 million red blood cells so can i clarify something this might be a silly goose question every second that's so scary 250 million a second so what if we don't have a spleen okay so if we don't have a spleen we can still me yeah so if somebody's had a splenectomy they do have some difficulty in that recycling process um the immune system steps up to the mark and uses macrophages and macrophages will tear apart the the bodies of red blood cells look macrophages are (laughs) Formidable, <laughs> formidable destroys. Wow. Um, and my second question might be dumb. So all red blood cells are haemoglobin? No, all red blood cells contain haemoglobin. Which carry the oxygen. That's right. That makes sense. Yeah. So your car, how many people can go in your car? It's a four-seater? Yeah. Five-seater. Five-seater, right? yeah. So it's got five seats. Yeah, yeah. Is your car a seat? No. Or is it a car that's got seats? It's a car that has seats. Right. Red blood cells are cells that have haemoglobin. Does that make sense? Yes. And so each haemoglobin, each one haemoglobin... Is a seat. Is like a seat. Wow. So, But there's 200 million haemoglobins in every red blood cell. And, and, it, and each haemoglobin can carry four oxygen. Yeah, I know. It's a bit dramatic, isn't it? It's, I don't know if it's dramatic. Only four oxygen. Wow. Well, it's a tiny little molecule. Carry some more. It's got other jobs to do. It's got to carry carbon dioxide as well. Well, who needs it that? Also carries, it also carries a, a, an, an acidic substance called carbonic anhydrase that helps to catalyse the conversion of carbon dioxide into either acid or into bicarbonate. Do you ever, have, do you ever think about anything other than medical stuff? Y- yes, yes. Whiskey, <laughs> mostly. <laughs> Whiskey. That's so funny. Okay, well, what else do you want to talk about? Uh, Look, I'm done. You've emptied out my brain. I now have to go and Google some stuff so I'm intelligent tomorrow. We should do a medication. Let's do a heart medication. I was thinking Dijoxin. Actually, can we touch on Dijoxin? Dijoxin. We don't have to do it in depth. Just wondering why they don't give it in the ward's IV. What's that about? Okay, so you kind of got caught out last night, didn't you? Be honest. (gasps) <gasps> Let's tell the world that you're not perfect. I'm not perfect. You delivered a patient to somewhere, somewhere which will remain unnamed. Yeah, nameless. Yeah. Um, the person who was receiving your patient could have been a bit kinder to you. Yeah. But the, po- the, the point is this: they rolled their eyes and they made it very, very clear that they made you feel stupid because you didn't know that by not giving the digoxin in the emergency department that you were delivering a patient to an area that normally can't give digoxin intravenously, all right? Yeah. How am I supposed to know that, by the way? Exactly right. Like, was there a time in your life that you didn't? Did you use yet? Did you say, I don't know that yet? No, I just just actually shut my mouth and didn't Shut your mouth? Because I was embarrassed. Hid in the tea room and cried for a while. No, I actually didn't cry about it, but it did make me a little bit sad because I felt like a silly goose. Yeah. Look, everybody doesn't know everything, okay? Yeah. So let's just talk very, very briefly. So digoxin is called a cardiac glycoside, and it's a medication. Yeah. So when we give digoxin to somebody, we're giving digoxin to somebody to increase the force of contraction of their heart. Yes, and inotropy. One of the ways that it does that not just increases the force of contraction, but it also slows the heart down slightly. So it, it's a cardiac decelerant, not an accelerant, a decelerant. So it slows the heart down. And this is why when you give digoxin to a patient on the ward, you're always asked to check their pulse. Check their pulse. That's right. So 
when giving digoxin to a patient orally, we can give a digoxin to a patient orally by increasing, uh, by giving a loading oral dose, or we can give an intravenous loading dose. And when we load somebody intravenously, there is a potential that they can flick into an arrhythmia and have a bready arrhythmia. So they can slow their heart down because it slows hearts down. It can actually cause a bready arrhythmia. So we want a patient on a cardiac monitor and we want to stay with the patient when we're giving them intravenous digoxin. Now, fast forward to a version of yourself as a nurse working in a ward. Have you got a cardiac monitor on your patient? Usually in a regular medical ward? Probs not. Probs not. All right. Standard medical ward isn't going to have cardiac monitoring. You might be lucky to work in a place that's got some telemetry, but you're not looking at the cardiac monitor. Somebody else is sitting at a computer somewhere watching the cardiac monitor. Does that make sense? Yeah. So if you were to give a big loading dose of intravenous digoxin to that patient and they went into an arrhythmia, you're not going to see it working in a ward. Do you see that that's potentially quite dangerous? We want to be in a critical care area. Yeah, that makes sense. When we're giving digoxin. I do feel like a silly goose, but it's okay. You shouldn't have been made to feel silly for something that you couldn't have known because you haven't come across that yet. Yeah, which she, which she also wouldn't have known that I didn't know that. But she should never assume. I know, but some do people do. Do you assume do. somebody's knowledge? Well, they were also like a consultant, so they probably assumed that everyone has some level of competence. Well, the consultant sounds like a dumbass to me. No, I just I, 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 I hate that, yeah. that idea that somebody that's got – what they consider to be superior knowledge to you should make anyone on their team feel dumb or stupid because they haven't done something yet. Mm. Or because they didn't know something. You didn't maliciously, lazily, you know, you weren't lazy in not giving the digoxin. You're having a chaotic shift and the digoxin didn't get given and you were remorseful and sorry and at yeah. the end of the day, no one died from that experience. It's yeah. not like something catastrophic. She didn't need to make you feel bad. Yeah. I actually want to bring something up, and this might be a little controversy, but I have had quite a few experiences as well as my co- as well as my colleagues. Why do some wards hate emergency nurses? Because I totally like I get what, like emergency. Yeah. We are a podcast for all nurses, and I guess what I don't want to do is fuel this whole us and them. There are a lot of departments that have forever. There are a lot of departments that forever have been at each other's throats. As a nurse working in a ward, you're an emergency nurse. You're bringing me work. I'm already snowed under. The last thing I want is another patient. Really, I'm tired. I'm exhausted, and you've just brought me another patient, and I've got to work up an admission on. So, who am I going to take it out on? Mm. Someone I have to work with and be friends with, or somebody that, but. There is another thing, and, and there was a um, there was an emergency um, specialist doctor that I worked with many years ago in Brisbane, and um, she did an amazing presentation at an emergency conference, an emergency um, doctors, paramedics, mm. nurses conference, and she was talking about tribalism, and it had nothing to do with culture. It had everything, well, it had everything to do with culture, but not culture in the way we think of culture, mm. not tribes as, as in the way you think of a tribe, but that emergency nurses and doctors are in that tribe Mm. and ICU doctors are in their tribe and ICU nurses are in their tribe and coronary care, that's a tribe, and medical ward, that's a tribe, and radiology, that's a tribe. Can you see we're in in our tribes? Mm. And when we're in our tribes, there's a sense of collegialness and safety and we, we look out for each other and we've got each other's backs. Nobody attacks an emergency nurse because other emergency nurses will be right on top of them. Do you see what I'm saying? Mm. We, we kind of look after our tribe. And what you experienced, oh, young one, last night is that you delivered a patient to another tribe. You came into their territory. Mm. And that is a natural human instinct that you have contempt for the other tribes. Now, I know that we should just sometimes be less primitive, but... We're just these anthropological beings. We're just monkeys in shoes. That's really interesting, actually, the way that you put that, because it's so true. I mean, I, I've i had, I've received patients when I was in mental health from ED, and I've, you know, afterwards probably gone, oh, 
I feel like I didn't get enough information from that. And look, let's be honest, sometimes you don't get everything done when you're in ED because you're just literally keeping people alive and in survival mode. An interesting thing that you did say when you were telling us about last night's shift, and that was that as you were wheeling the patient, and I'm, we, we have to maintain our confidentiality here, mm. of course, as you were wheeling the patient through to that specialist unit where you were wheeling them, didn't the patient say to you, have you ever been there before? No, it was the wardsman. The wardsman. Yeah. And then they shared their experience, yeah. negative experience of taking a patient to that ward. Mm. So it's almost like, see, that wardsman's part of your tribe. Yeah. He was really almost, interesting. he was almost in a way kind of preparing you to go into another territory. Mm. Can you see that that was, that was almost part of like, you know, he's trying to pre-warn you that this might be a bit brutal when you get a hand over to these people because they can be notoriously nasty to ED nurses. Yeah. Yeah. It's, 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 it's it understandable, but it is a shame. It's always been there and yeah. we can grizzle about it until the cows come home. But yeah. at the end of the day, we, we all recognize that it happens. Not that it's okay, but yeah. we recognize that it happens and it really is part of our tribalism. Yeah. It's just one of those things. It's a really interesting anthropological discussion. Mm. Mm. Anyhow, it's been, a, it's been a really eclectic mix of, of uh, of topics that we've talked about today, um, can I just come very very quickly back to the cardiac glycoside digoxin? Yes. It's used for antiarrhythmias. Uh, it's used as an antiarrhythmic, uh, typically for a patient with atrial fibrillation (AF). Uh, it's a little bit of an older drug. It's been used for many many years since at least the 1970s. And um, yes, if you've got a patient on digoxin, please just have a look at what their pulse rate is before you. Give it, and if you're giving it INV, the patient does need to be on a um, on a cardiac monitor while you're loading them. Mm, yeah. Yep. Slay. Have you learned today? I have. You do. I now know what a spleen is. I'm going to go tell everyone that it's an awful massacred freaking it's not, organ. It's protecting you every moment of your life. <laughs> but no, if it's cool. if it's in, inflamed or enlarged, it's it's working, yeah. and you have to say, well, what's making my spleen become really active? And it's often that there's some sort of an inflammatory process, infective process going on. It's called splenomegaly. Of course it is. Splenomegaly. 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 That's your word of the day. No, I think my word of the day is... Um... You've forgotten it already. <laughs> You'll have to choose a new, new word okay. of the day. <laughs> All right. I've been um, Nurse Rob. In fact, I, I'm still Nurse Rob. Still, yeah. <laughs> and I've been and still am Nurse Amy. And thank you so much for listening to our episode of Egg Topics. I hope you enjoyed this part two episode. And, yeah, let us know what you think. We'll see you next time. Bye. Ta-ta.